This is a sermon from St. Paul's Church, Brookfield, Connecticut, transforming lives through Jesus. For more information, go to www.stpaulsbrookfield.com. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus liked to pray, and he liked to go to parties. <laughs> During his ministry, there was nothing like television, or the telephone, or the internet. Yet people had a hunger for information just like we do today. And it was at these gatherings, such as the one where we find Jesus from the Gospel this morning, where information was conveyed. Here, all in town were allowed to attend such a dinner party. Yet, not all were welcome at the table itself. Shepherds, camel drivers, day laborers, the differently abled, as we would call them today, that is, those considered unclean, they could come in, yet they had to stand at the back, in the shadows, where they could listen intently to the conversation, but they could not approach the table. During the meal, only the ritually clean, the insiders who supposedly kept the religious law, they were the ones to be at center stage. From Paul's epistle to the Galatians this morning, we get a sense of this mindset when he writes, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Jesus mingled with all kinds of people, the clean and the unclean, rich and poor, religious and non-religious, self-righteous and self-condemning, those who would accept him and those who wanted to trap him, like Simon, the Pharisee, his host. I mean, that's why Jesus was invited, after all. They were seeking to trap him so that they could start to remove him from this world. And even though Simon publicly disrespected Jesus by not offering him what any guest would receive, which would be the washing of feet, notice Jesus did not take offense the way we might in this world as fallen humans who are easily bruised and wounded, not Jesus. No, his message was the same to all those who would receive him and those who tried to trap him. His message was and is today, come to me. Come to me. He offered not judgment, but love for all people. Suddenly with shocking boldness, who comes to this party? A prostitute. And she approaches the table, and in Jesus' presence, she begins to weep. She rained down tears. That's what the Greek word conveys. It wasn't just some tears coming down. She was raining tears. Why? We'll find out soon. With these very tears, she washes Jesus' feet. She kisses them, and then she lets down her hair. Now, this was scandalous, because the rabbis taught then that a married man, if his wife let down her hair in public, he could divorce her. I just picture Simon's face as this is going on, and there's something powerful and comical, sad and hopeful all at the same moment. What was this man thinking as he looked at his dinner party going to arrive? <laughs> then she takes her perfume. We're told it was an alabaster container. Now, prostitutes often wore them around their necks with a leather cord, a little alabaster container of perfume. She puts it on Jesus' feet. She touches him. Have you noticed that Jesus could relate closely to so many kinds of outcasts and never be tainted by their vices? Anyone who came to Jesus in faith was made more like him. He never more like them. 
There was something about this Jesus. The broken were drawn in. And Jesus was accused of many things, including hanging out with sinners, but engaging in immorality with sinners was never something he was accused of. Never. Think about that. He was so close, and yet he was so holy. So set apart. And it was for a purpose, to save sinners. Even Simon the Pharisee, rather than assuming that this woman and Jesus had had some kind of prior relationship, which would be a tempting thing to try to pin on Jesus after this episode at the table, Simon does not go there. No. Instead of that realizing it, he declares Jesus' purity by suggesting that he is simply unaware of what kind of woman this is. The best he can come up with in his mind is that he's not much of a prophet. And yet John in his gospel reminds us that Jesus knew the hearts of all people. And so he knows what Simon is thinking inwardly. And so he offers a parable about two debtors. And at the conclusion, Jesus asks him, which of them will love him more? Now, some parables are very confusing. This one's pretty straightforward. Simon answered, I love this, I suppose one for whom he canceled the greater debt. I suppose. It could be sarcasm. Like, it's almost insulting his intelligence. Like, isn't it obvious what this parable means? Or he might be even saying, well, I suppose it's the one whom he forgave more, wondering whether Jesus has something up his sleeve that is going to put a twist on this story and embarrass him if he gives the wrong answer. Notice this about Jesus. He's always in control. Even when everything is set against him, he is in control because he's all about the Father's will. So Simon... He's just a little shy of giving our Lord a complete answer, a straightforward answer. He's holding back, as opposed to the woman who holds nothing back in that moment. Jesus is saying that you, Simon, you just saw love like you've never seen it. You see, when Jesus came into the world through his ministry over the course of three years, he healed people. They had never seen healings. They've never seen anybody display love like this. So the question Jesus is asking Simon is, what would make somebody so loving, so lavish, so grateful? This would. Her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. And that's the perfect tense in the Greek, and I'll tell you why that's important. That means it didn't happen right there at the party. It means that something happened in the past with continuing effects. And this gives us insight that something happened between Jesus and this woman prior to the party where she was led to put her faith in him. After her initial encounter with Jesus, she couldn't contain her love and she went looking for him. Before Simon's interrogation of Jesus could even get underway under the guise of a friendly meal, she crashes the party, not looking to the left or the right, not caring what other people think. Right at Jesus, she looks. Simon was there to judge. She was there to love. For she came to worship her Savior. What she offered was nothing short of worship. Who is this that forgives sins? Those at the table wondered aloud. Simon was thinking things in his heart. These folks couldn't contain themselves. They whispered that among themselves. They believed, as law-abiding Jews, correctly, that only God could forgive sins. And so Jesus was making a claim that no human was entitled to make. In their blindness, Jesus was offering spiritual sight. Now think about the outcasts in the back of the room, watching from afar. They would see. And as we look at the whole of the New Testament, we see many outcasts suddenly see. And yet we see those right next to Jesus remaining blind. Because spiritual sight is a work of God. It's 
not human merit, human effort. It's only something that the Spirit of God can do. You can't see forgiveness. What you can see is the transformation that it makes. Joy. Gratitude. Bold love. To receive Christ's forgiveness is to exercise that gift of faith that cannot be seen. And yet there's that visible outflow of love without cost or care. And so you have Jesus' concluding words to her. Your faith has saved you. Notice it's not her love that saved her. It's her faith that saved her, that then produced love. Again, let's think about Galatians that we just heard. We have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law. What does this mean today? This means that we are forgiven not by what we can do for Jesus, but by what he has done for us. Ultimately, dying for our sins and rising for our eternal freedom. Let's bring this message home now to our very hearts. We can never ask ourselves this question enough, no matter how long we've been on this road of faith. Have you come to faith in Christ? Have you embraced Him and experienced His transforming forgiveness that, so that you are filled with love? If love is lacking, what might we be holding back from God and from others? It is that profuse love for Christ that is the single greatest proof to people of the power of the gospel. Some of us even go on to become what are called fools for Christ. Uninterested in what others think about us as we keep our focus entirely on Jesus, going where he leads us, unconcerned with the opinions of others. This is what spiritual freedom looks like. This is what radical faith looks like. And so our passage from Luke concludes with Jesus gathering a ragtag, grateful band of followers, men and women, once broken and now becoming whole with the promise that every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. And today, we continue to add to this procession of grace, one redeemed soul at a time, God doing the work, we participate in the mystery of salvation, and we show forth to those yet to join us, not judgment, but faith that produces love. And with Jesus as our host, we offer a table that is open to all, insider and outsider alike. Where might our Savior want to lead you today? Are you ready to go? Someone once said, I'm a fool for Jesus. Whose fool are you? You see, ultimately, we all belong to someone or something. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Our journey is just beginning. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.